Hi, welcome to this presentation. This will be a brief overview of HTML and Flash to help you make decisions about when to use which of these technologies. Most of this will probably be familiar to developers already, so it will be most useful for business people, managers, people trying to make decisions about where to invest their time. HTML as we know it, which is most of the internet that we're familiar with, started around 1990. The most recent incarnation, more or less, that we've been using for the last uh, over a decade, uh, HTML4, and that started up around 1997. Flash as a technology has been around since 1996, uh, with a new version coming out every one to two years. Uh, we'll get into what it means when I say a new version comes out, because there's actually an authoring version and then the player that views the content. And so HTML, specifically HTML5 and Flash, are often confused as competitors. Let's take a look at HTML. When pe people talk about HTML5, uh, whether they realize it or not, they're sort of speaking in a shorthand. HTML is actually at least three different technologies. So the three technologies that make up HTML are HTML itself, which is what makes it a little confusing. Then there's JavaScript and there's CSS. HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language, basically a text container. On the top, you'll see the HTML, and there are P tags, which are designate paragraph tags. When you talk about a markup language, we're basically talking about these tags that are defined within these greater than or less than symbols. And what you can see at the bottom of the screen is what it looks like when it's rendered. So they're actually separated as paragraphs. And there's a whole lot of other markup but that's the basic of HTML. Adding CSS to your HTML is really what sets it apart visually. This is just an example of what CSS looks like, a little bit of what it allows you to do. That P tag, we can assign a font family and a font size, and we can do things like give the first letter of each paragraph a special property. So you can see what that's rendered below. This is really basic CSS to give you an idea of what it looks like. JavaScript was introduced in 1995 in Netscape Navigator. They basically took the name Java, which was already an established programming language, to lend credibility to their new scripting language and called it JavaScript. But they really don't have much to do with each other. That's something that people often confuse. They'll say Java when they mean JavaScript. The programming of HTML, any of the interactivity, almost anything logical where a decision has to be made, if something is a certain size, do this. If a user clicks that something, do this. Most of that takes place in JavaScript. JavaScript processes data on the client side. When we say client side, is basically what happens in the browser while the user is navigating, as opposed to the server where all of the information is stored. Now, a lot of what we see as HTML now derived from Ajax, which the capability for Ajax arose in 1999, but it wasn't coined as a term till 2005. It stands for asynchronous JavaScript and XML. What it added was the asynchronicity. So normally when you were navigating on the web, you'd click a link and it'd take you to another page and you get this blank white space while you're waiting for the next page to load. And what Ajax did was you basically click and you stay on the page, it sends a request to the server from the, from the client in JavaScript and then gets a response back and then updates the display. So if you think of Gmail, when you click, you don't see this blank white space when you go from looking at your inbox to clicking on a message. And that's basically Ajax. And that, as much as anything, is where HTML started to look more like Flash because Flash at the time was really the only asynchronous technology that worked like that. And this is what JavaScript looks like. On the top you can see the code. We are declaring variables and then we have we have some logic. So we're saying if the screen is less than this width that we set, if it's less than this height we set, then it, it's going to display a message to the user. The user doesn't see that logic happening, but they see the result. Down below you can see the alert to the user. It says, hey, your, your screen is too small to properly view this page. So that's sort of JavaScript's role. So HTML5 is a continuation, but it adds some of the new things that people are really excited about. The canvas tag is a place to paint pixels, which adds, again, more of that sort of asynchronous feeling of the visuals of the page updating without having to load another web page. 
There's the video tag when HTML5 was first announced, going to be one of the main sort of flash killers. And it turned out to be a little bit more complicated than that because actually because it's more open, the Flash player has licensed media codecs to actually play different video formats. They're having, having problems getting that consistent across different browsers with the HTML5 video tag. Um, and there's additionally, there's a, it's a little bit harder to mix in the interactivity and people to build ads on it and that kind of stuff. But it is one of the, the big new capabilities. It will be replacing Flash video over time largely with complex fallbacks to make sure that whatever a person's system has, it will you know either play in the video tag with some kind of format or to show a Flash video player. So there's also the audio tag, which has some of the similar issues with the video tag. And then there's the possibility of offline storage. And this is probably most useful and most geared toward mobile devices so that if somebody doesn't have a connection at a certain point, they can still view at least pieces of a web page. CSS has a new version along with HTML, and that's CSS3. And this is largely where a lot of the neat stuff in HTML5 has been added. So CSS3 has has animation, has a possibility of embedding fonts, which has always been one of the design limitations of the web, is that you have to design with the four fonts that everybody has. Well, that's that's changing over time. Multi-column layout, another big design desire. Um, rounded corners, gradients. These are things that normally, if you were a designer, you had to slice up images. You'd have to have an image for every single corner to have a rounded corner. And then maybe a separate image for the places in between the corners and the center. Same thing with gradients. Now you can do it with some, some simple CSS styling. That's really nice. There's also transformations, and these are being adopted differently, but you'll see in some of the Apple devices, you'll see this kind of 3D rotation of something flipping around. That's being done with CSS. And then there are also media queries that allow you to, to change the visual properties of your web page based on person's display size, which is a very handy thing to be able to do in CSS and not have to write JavaScript for it. JavaScript is largely untouched in HTML5. It's got hooks for the new capabilities in HTML and CSS, but it's basically the same beast. Where you're going to see HTML being in, implemented is in your browsers. Firefox, Safari, Internet Explorer, Chrome, obviously on the mobile browsers as well. That's one of the limitations of HTML is that there are so many different producers of the browsers. And so those producers have to essentially get in line with a set of standards. At the same time, it's up to the user to make sure their, their browsers are up to date as well. So it's a pretty slow process. That's one of the main challenges. You know, one browser has some features, another browser doesn't. That is a big problem for people developing websites. Um, and as I mentioned, client adoption, it's not just the companies that make the browsers, but it's the people who are using the browsers. It's up to them to download the updated versions. One of the other large challenges is that there is not really an authoring environment for HTML5. There are HTML tools. Their Dreamweaver has been around for several versions, for example. But uh, in terms of making these interactive experiences that people are talking about where HTML5 really mirrors what Flash can do, we're a ways off from that. We're not even quite to generation one. And as you'll see with Flash, we're several generations down the road. And then there's the big challenge of the standard, which all of the companies that make browsers are going to work off of, and then clients, as in end users, are going to be downloading. The standards are not even complete yet. If you go to ishtml5readyyet.com, you can see an updated countdown for this. As of the timing of this, it's, it's over three years away. But those are being op implemented on the fly by all these browser producers. So you, so you can see a lot of the features yet, but they're not final in the specification that's being set up by the independent committee who decides HTML features. So let's look at Flash. And one of the main things to understand about Flash is that it's actually a platform. It's not one single thing. There are three tiers, as I've laid it out here. There are authoring tools. Those are the things that allow you to create Flash content, meaning drawing things, making rich internet applications, making desktop applications, mobile applications, games. And those tools made by Adobe are Flash Professional, Flash Builder, formerly Flex Builder, and Flash Catalyst. And then there's a file format. All of these tools essentially output a Swift file, and then that Swift file is played back in different ways. The main way is the, uh, the Flash Player, which is the plugin that you see on the web. And then there's Air, which allows you to export as a desktop 
application, well, and also to mobile devices, and we'll talk about that. And the one thing out of this whole platform that's really explicitly been nixed is Flash Player Mobile. So Android devices did have this version of the browser plugin for Flash so that if I visited a website with Flash, I could see it on my mobile device. But so far, most of the rest of this entire platform is still in place. First, let's look at Flash authoring. You can see a screenshot of the tool. It's rather complex. It's, it's like the 11th or 12th generation, depending on how you're counting it. It has a full set of vector drawing tools. And it started out as a vector drawing and animation application for the web. And vectors are just basically mathematically drawn lines rather than pixels. So the advantage of this was that if your lines are basically simple math formulas, they take less file space to store. And so this was really great when everybody had dial-up. It's still pretty useful today. Maybe in another video we'll talk about how vector versus bitmap is. That's sort of changing because of the rendering on mobile devices. You can see at the bottom there's the timeline of slides. So that's really its origin. And then interactivity was added to this. So not only is this a drawing and an animation tool, you can actually program with it uh, with a pretty serious programming language. Outputting the format, which you then view generally in the Flash Player as binary, but it's an actually an openly published standard. But essentially what that means is that it's a bunch of ones and zeros in a machine language, as opposed to HTML, which you could just open up and look at the source and you can see the JavaScript and the CSS for the most part. And so you can sort of reverse engineer it a lot quicker than you can reverse engineer a binary format. So I mentioned it combines frame-based animation. That's one of the main things to know about Flash is that it started as an animation tool. Usually it's embedded in a, in a web page to view with HTML. Examples of Flash Player, you know, most of the video players on the web are Flash-based. You know, YouTube, although it is converting to HTML5 over time, games, interactive tours. I have an example here of a, a game I built almost entirely in Flash using the graphical tools to build the character and actually make him move. And then the, the programming language also built into it to add the interactivity that allows the, the player of the game to move the character around and throw the ball and that kind of thing. So then there's the Air format, which is the future of Flash with mobile devices because the, the mobile browser plugin has been nixed. This is probably going to be where Flash gets used the most going forward. So it allows you to make a desktop application without actually knowing one of the what's considered one of the really intense languages like C, C++, and you have the advantage of having visual tools. So you can actually make an application that sits on somebody's desktop and looks like an application. In addition to that, Adobe has created this packager that will take your Air application and package it into an iPad app or an iPhone app. And you can do the same with Android and Blackberry. So it's a pretty effective way to, instead of getting your content out as a website, you can get it out as an app to the mobile device. So that format is probably gonna be still pretty important for some time to come. And its greatest strength is the rapid development because it has an authoring tool. And that'll change over time as HTML5 gets more authoring capabilities rather than having people hand code it. Sort of limits the number of people who can work on the project. Things to remember, uh, HTML5 and Flash are not necessarily competitors, though you will at times have to make decisions about which technology you're gonna go with or how one one technology is going to sort of fall back on another. That decision is probably a topic for its own video. HTML5, remember, it's at least three technologies. Flash, almost the same way, it's actually a platform. So there is the authoring tool, the file format, and the players that allow you to view it. HTML5 or HTML6 or whatever comes later, those capabilities probably will replace Flash over time. As you can see, time is a pretty important characteristic in the adoption. With that, I hope you've gotten a good overview of these technologies. Maybe you can come back for a later video to dive a little deeper into some of the specifics.